in a future so distant that all has decayed to nothingness and time itself ceases to exist, might this eternal moment of oblivion bring on a fiery resurrection to all of space and time. So today we're going to be looking at conformal cyclic cosmology, which suggests we may be living in a cyclic universe that fades out to nothing and then resets, along with some other cyclic scenarios from other cosmological models that might leave remnants behind that we could detect. A year back we did an episode looking at the concept of Omega Point Cosmology, the notion that life might be heading to some massive unified and eternal mind that was very popular under the Big Crunch cosmology which has grown out of favor with our expanding knowledge of dark energy and the accelerating expansion of our own universe. As we discussed in that episode, simply because dark energy is still so mysterious, there are still pathways by which a big crunch might happen, and our episodes Black Hole Farming and Iron Stars, which were two of the show's early hits about eight years back, explored the alternative eternal expansion option for life going on after the star was born out, known as Dyson's Eternal Intelligence. Those were the start of our Civilizations of the End of Time series, of which Omega Point was our most recent entry and where we try to figure out how civilization could survive into such eras and under different fates of the Universe, and in those we explore deep time at a scale where even a trillion years is but an eye blink of time. But one implication of Big Crunch scenarios is that the Universe might expand, contract, then expand again, cyclic Big Bangs. And as I was finishing up that episode, I decided I wanted to expand on a theory that had a novel approach to both eternal expansion and a cyclic universe, Roger Penrose's Conformal Cyclic Cosmology. That ran on Nebula as an exclusive bonus companion episode and was when we switched from doing expanded editions of episodes over on Nebula to standalone episodes, as people preferred them and I figured I'd bring them over to YouTube a year later so everyone could enjoy them. Initially I actually managed to keep those bonus episodes relatively short, today's is only 10 minutes, but most of our Nebula exclusive episodes these days are full length, and we release a new one every month. And we'll be showing that original in just a moment before I go on to expand on some of the discussion about how you could see an order universe predating ours and what other scenarios might produce such remnants, so an expanded edition of what was the expanded edition of another episode. I will also note briefly that this episode's order segment was recorded a year ago before I had surgery on my tongue and follow up speech therapy so my speech impediment is likely to be more noticeable and as always captions are available. All that said, let's begin our look at the end of the universe and its potential rebirth. Welcome to another Nebula exclusive short extending on our topic today of the Omega Point and the Big Crunch where we also discussed an alternate theory on the origins and fate of the universe by Roger Penrose, Conformal Cyclic Cosmology, and I felt the topic deserved more discussion but that it would carry us outside of the zone of that episode. It is probably a good idea to watch the episode first as we discuss some basic concepts there already. Now the keyword in Conformal Cyclic Cosmology is cyclic, as this is one of our examples of a beginning and end of the universe where things just keep restarting and similar to Poincare Recurrence. In Poincare Recurrence we assume a universe that randomly reshuffles back to its starting point, much as if you shuffle a deck of cards enough times you'll eventually repeat the order the cards were in sometime before that. But that does not work in an expanding universe and neither does a big crunch scenario where the universe seems to be accelerating in expansion and thus should not be able to recollapse unless whatever is driving that expansion ceases, which as we discussed in Omega Point may be possible. We can't make too many assumptions about the properties of mysterious dark energy, since its best known current property is that it's mysterious and we don't know why it exists, where it comes from or why it seems to be increasing, nor if it should keep doing so forever. It's hard to have a repeating universe if the place is eternally expanding, but conformal cyclic cosmology gets around that by basically having the grand reset happen when the universe is so old that the only things left that exist are timeless particles like photons. In a universe where space and time are essentially out of play, because all that exists are particles that experience no time, you can argue that distance no longer exists anymore and the whole universe is suddenly infinitely dense and point-like again, like a black hole or the conditions of the Big Bang. 
Conceptually, you can think of it as saying that things have spread out so much and decayed so much that the concept ceases to mean anything. We'll come back to that shortly. Incidentally, since the word conformal isn't in daily usage by most folks, it is a term for math and maps that basically has to do with angles and shapes being preserved even when carved. Imagine a sheet of grid paper lying flat, all squares and 90 degree right angles. Now curve it and observe that it's no longer really squares and 90 degree angles between two lines, but that at the same time it still is on that sheet. For conceptual ease, imagine you crunch that sheet of paper into a tight ball. It is now very dense, with many lines touching, but the sheet still has that wide layout of nice even squares, and this is essentially what the concept is arguing. Conceptually I can expand that sheet too, so the squares are feet or meters wide, not inches or centimeters, or even light years, and in the end if I can find a situation where it's the equivalent of all scrunched up in some other dimension, it's still a flat sheet but also simultaneously an infinitely dense tiny ball. It just depends on who is observing it, someone on that sheet or outside it. You can do a similar trick by rolling that sheet up like a scroll, only one very tight to the point it was an infinitely thin and dense line, and so too you can replace such a sheet with a 3D matrix grid as well, and then squish it into a 4 dimensional space into an infinitely dense sheet, or infinitely dense line or point too, and yet the grid is preserved in the frame of reference of that sheet, while smashed up and infinitely dense in the frame of someone standing outside, much as crumply a map up. Again that's the concept, the real math gets trickier, but what's the physics angle? Well, as I mentioned, some particles like photons don't experience time themselves. As we discussed in other episodes, time slows down as you approach the speed of light and stops entirely at it. We believe photons have no mass at all and travel at the true speed of light, though it is always possible that they and gravitons do have some tiny bit of mass, less even than a neutrino, and thus go just a hair under light speed as a result. Light speed is something of a dated term and it should really be the speed of causality, or cause and effect, but our current belief is that photons do move at that speed and that the speed of light, gravity, and causality are all the same. If it turned out that there were no totally massless particles, conformal cyclic cosmology would be invalidated. Well if I'm a photon being emitted back when the universe is young and hitting your eyeball now, I have existed for billions of years and covered billions of light years. But to me there was simply the instant transfer from emission to absorption. As that photon, I don't experience time. So let's imagine two photons on different journeys but both pass through the same spot at some point, only a billion years apart. To them, they intersected because their journey crossed paths and it doesn't matter if it was an eon apart. Now as channel regulars know, it isn't really mass but energy that generates gravity, so if you cram enough photons together at the same point and moment in time, you get a black hole, what we call a Kugelblitz black hole, and we've talked about using them to power spaceships. Over time they evaporate via Hawking radiation and they make amazing batteries, see our black hole episodes for details. If we have tons of photons intersecting a given point over untold quintillions of years, you do not get a black hole, because they weren't at the same place at the same time. We, as humans experiencing time, do exist in time and thus wouldn't observe a black hole there. However, as the universe ages, even the black holes in it expire and turn into photons in the process, and every little bit of matter slowly decays into something timeless like a photon, until nothing left in the universe experiencing time exists and no frame of reference exists anymore experiencing time. Thus you can argue that no time exists anymore, and it is more than a metaphysical hand wave, Remember time is a real and changeable quantity that runs faster or slower in certain situations like strong gravity wells or high velocities. Whatever time is, and that's still a bit of a mystery, it is not a constant and unchangeable thing, independent of the universe around it. This then, the moment after everything experiencing time ceases to be, the end of time in a very literal sense, could be argued to see every photon now being all there is and all in the same place at the same time or all the energy of the universe compacted again into a tiny point, and that's conformal cyclic cosmology, minus the math and some more complex physics. Including the notion that in the absence of time, space should also be seen as basically ceasing to be. Now for quick criticisms, the two obvious ones is if it really counts as an absence of space and time just because nothing is around to experience it, 
and it's a little hard to check that. We as an observer cannot make observations in any place this would be true. The other thing is the argument that not all particles should degenerate into photons or gravitons, and that is a long-standing debate involving proton decay and some other matters. Penrose does make the argument this still works if the amount of mass in the universe is not quite zero, just insignificant, and thus not everything needs to be a photon or similar massless particle, and again it shouldn't work if it turns out photons have a tiny little bit of mass. It also shouldn't allow anyone to survive into a new Aeon, his term for each iteration of the universe between Big Bang and this fizzle to heat death, but because gravity also moves at light speed it could survive to new Aeons and leave a footprint. We should be able to check if this theory is true by detecting that footprint, and experiments have been proposed for doing that, but it is too soon to say if it's true or not. One final note on the concept before we close out. As gravity could leave a footprint between iterations, it would theoretically be possible to arrange objects into patterns that would survive into the next iteration, as visible. This brings up the notion of informational panspermia, where you could write a message to the next universe, or receive one from the prior, carved into space-time by gravity. But as we know from other episodes on transhumanism, if you can send information, you can send people too, copies of their mind for instance, though presumably it requires someone in the next Aeon to receive, decode, and download that brain. For fans of Stargate Universe who remember the mission becoming about trying to see a message in the cosmic microwave background radiation, I am pretty sure this is the basis for that plotline. Either way, that's quite a trick for surviving past the end of time, or just sending messages, and odds are good if the theory is true that someone did send a message and we may be able to see it even this century, or download them. But not for today, and on that note we'll wrap up for the day. Thanks again for joining us for another Nebula special. So we'll be talking a bit more about how this universal respawn is supposed to work, why it might leave a ghostly remnant, and what other scenarios, like point care recurrence, might leave remnants too. But first, if you like the idea of new universes and life emerging all over again intrigues you, there's an excellent and free-to-play science-based game called Sound of Singularity that starts you from the beginning of everything and lets you carry life forward and up the evolutionary tech trees from that first moment all the way through a technological singularity and settling neighboring worlds. Zelda Singularity's developers are part of our audience, and the game explores many concepts and themes we've discussed, using accurate science and research, but inside an artfully done sci-fi theme. Tap into the extraordinary tale of evolution in this cosmic clicker game where you start as a single-celled organism, then upgrade your biology, intellect, and technology until you engulf an entire planet with a civilization on the brink of technological singularity, explore from early Earth out to among the stars in a game that fits easily into your busy day and again is free to play. Whether you're on PC or phone, just search Zelda Singularity on Steam, Google Play, or iOS and start evolving your new civilization today. So welcome back to part 2 as we expand on our discussion on repeating universes, where we'll talk a bit more about conformal cyclic cosmology but also other cosmological models that offer some sort of repetition or remnant ghost universe left behind. As mentioned, the episode was originally a companion piece to our look at the Big Crunch cosmology, where the universe expands from a small point at the Big Bang then falls back in on itself as gravity catches up with things. It could then presumably repeat this process of banging back out again, though the mechanism for that occurring is a little unclear. Since it came out a year ago, I have had a chance to come up with some other analogies and explanations that seem to work for folks too, and one that came to mind after our zero point and vacuum energy episode in the fall is to think of our universe as an expanding and dissipating oil slick over a greater and more energetic reality. There's an energy beneath what we normally think of as the vacuum where virtual particles pop in and out of existence constantly and quite a lot of it, and this energy should remain even after things in the universe wind down, and occurs everywhere all of the time. Indeed those virtual particles sometimes get used as an objection to conformal cyclic cosmology. But in discussing the false vacuum, I've used the analogy that our reality floats on the quantum sea like an oil slick and is spreading out with time and someone asked me if that might be why dark energy is accelerating, 
less barrier to walk through, so to speak. I don't think evidence would support that view beyond being an interesting conceptual explanation, but we could overlay that analogy for conformal sacred cosmology. Once that oil slick of reality thins down completely, there is no barrier to new energy pouring through from wherever big bangs, virtual particles, and dark energy all come from, and out from this place comes a new universe. It's all such mysterious and primordial stuff though that it doesn't pay to get too fixated on any cosmological theory at the moment, let alone an analogy presented for discussing it. So we'll discuss several other cosmologies today, and continue that by continuing our discussion of the Big Crunch cosmology. Dark Energy puts a crimp in Big Crunch cosmology since the idea there is that expansion has some inertia that is slowing as gravity tries to bring a finite universe back together. So the rate of expansion of the universe should be slowing over time, but current data says the reverse, that expansion is actually speeding up. The source of this expansion is some unknown energy which is mysterious and dark to us, thus dark energy. New bits of space and time seem to emerge everywhere all at once, and unlike with virtual particles, these stick around, so it would seem to put a nail in Big Crunch's shrinking coffin. Except that since we have no idea what dark energy is or where it comes from, it is entirely possible it just stops arriving from wherever it comes from, if it comes from anywhere at all, at which point the Universe could presumably contract again. I should also note that the old model of the Universe that was around from shortly after Isaac Newton's work until the mid-20th century was the Steady State Model, which holds that the Universe is infinite in size and age and does not fall in on itself precisely because it is infinite. There is no center for stuff to fall towards, and there is infinite mass on every side of you pulling you evenly from all directions. This is the cosmology where we first encounter point care recurrence and will return to it momentarily along with Boltzmann brains, which date from the same period and speculations. This model was growing out of favor from the appearance of Hubble expansion and the growing knowledge of thermodynamics arguing entry should be kicking in over time and thus the infinitely old Universe should already be utterly maxed out on entropy and dead. Many attempts to fix this model were proposed as patches, and one that was proposed and often mocked years later as absurd was that perhaps new bits of mass or energy were occasionally emerging, that about one particle of hydrogen would be appearing in any given cubic meter of space about once every 300,000 years or so on average to refresh supplies, for new stars to be born from. This is a flawed notion, but I've always found it amusing how it was ridiculed in the 50s and 60s only to re-emerge in the similar form of dark energy a few decades later, or the quantum foam for that matter. It also often got mocked for the absurdity of matter or energy appearing out of nowhere, which was particularly ironic given that this is the core of the Big Bang cosmology that was replacing it mini bangs and at the atomic level, but there's no real reason to think that something that happened once can't happen many times, quite to the contrary. But this is also our first example of how an ancient universe could leave remnants behind, and not in the context of an eternal and infinite universe which had no bangs as with steady state, but rather a universe in which big bangs occur occasionally and leave an expanding pocket of new space and matter in them. These may be of some specific new amount of mass and energy, or they may be spread all the way from the atomic level up to bigger than ours, but they pop up and maybe the explanation for continued expansion that accelerates is that they begin emerging onto the existing wider universe and lose cohesion to it faster and faster until merging on in, that dissipating oil slick analogy from earlier. This wider universe may or may not be infinite, and indeed our own Big Bang could have been infinite from the outset and merely the portion we can see, which is finite, might have emerged from a tiny finite portion of a smaller and expanding but still infinite proto-universe. Infinity is not an actual number, and yes you can have infinities that are bigger than other infinities. As an example, a line can be infinitely long and two perpendicular infinitely long lines can map out an infinitely large area that is infinite in two dimensions, and which would be bigger than a 2D plane that was infinite in one direction but only finite in another, like an infinitely long ribbon. And if that ribbon started off as a skinny one and began expanding to be wider, it's still infinite from start to finish but is getting bigger in that finite dimension. To stretch the analogy, or rather crunch it, 
We could imagine rolling that ribbon up along its width to be an infinitely long and compressed tube that might start expanding into a new ribbon that was flat in some new dimension of our choosing, and one can think of that as a decent mental analogy for some of our scenarios like Conformal Sacred Cosmology too, if the prior explanations did not work for you. I should note that there's a lot of recent discussion publicly if the Big Bang Theory might be wrong or off in some fashion, and for clarification, that is not new. There was a period where questioning it, or if aliens might exist, or if you could travel faster than light tended to result in a few folks openly and loudly criticizing anyone who did and often made the news, so it tended to discourage people from doing many papers or conversations about it. Scientists are human after all. For all that I happen to be a big fan of the Big Bang, think aliens are probably ultra-rare or non-existent, and don't believe FTL will ever happen, I always loathe the tendency to discourage or even sneer at folks who want to talk aliens, warp drives, or alternative cosmologies. One of those ideas getting talked around a lot now is that there may have been a second Big Bang right on the heels of the first, or several right in a row, as possible alternatives to the difficulty of cosmic inflation right after the Big Bang. Now, steady state cosmology is still on the outs, even though we often still consider the possibility the universe is infinitely old and vast, just not the portion carved out by our Big Bang or its local chunk. One reason is that never handled Orbor's paradox well, which worries why in an infinite universe you shouldn't be able to see stars out infinitely in each direction and infinitely back in time, hence the night sky should be white, not black and many Remnant Universe scenarios have these same sorts of problems of why artifacts of prior universes or older pieces of the universe aren't piling up everywhere, including alien civilizations left over from then which might have sought to survive the end of their universe or simply expanded from their universe into this one from wherever they overlap. We get the same issue there with point care recurrence, which was made for the steady state model but tends to have equivalents in other cosmologies too. And point care recurrence is technically a complete reset, where you shuffled the proverbial pack of cards until it returned to its original order, but in practice you have a huge number of states that are close enough, especially given that the intent is really to reset entropy, not history. We don't actually care if the universe is in an exact state it previously inhabited with lower entropy, just if it reshuffled to allow some new entropy to be available. If all you want is your card deck to have 5 cards of the same suit in order and you don't care which ones or where in the deck they are, that's going to happen way more often than returning that deck to the original setup, where all the cards are in order fresh from the factory. And this will occur way more often too. In a steady state setup, some region of the universe will grind itself down on entropy and have a reshuffle eventually that brought back some order, but far smaller than before and in a different arrangement including entirely randomly assembled brains, the Boltzmann brain, relatively often, and so you get remnants here of prior universes all over. However, the reset periods under point care, even for something as simple as a Boltzmann brain, a randomly assembled brain as opposed to a whole galaxy or supercluster, are way longer than stars and galaxies live, so all those remnants might disappear even between micro-resets. Similarly, in a big rip scenario where the universe just keeps expanding faster and faster till even atoms are pulled apart, we could contemplate that this even rips quarks apart. When you tear a pair of quarks apart, the energy used to rip them asunder is as much energy as is needed to make two new quarks, so you just end up converting that energy into two new pairs of quarks, rip those both apart and you get four, then eight, and so on, and possibly create another local Big Bang and one occurring everywhere in the Universe too. Were that to happen, it's hard to imagine how you could send anything across that atom-rending epoch to survive into a new Universe and anything apart any distance, even the human scale, would be scattered over whole Universal volumes. Plus, nothing there implies this process of rending even atoms apart stops either. But perhaps it does and perhaps you could send some signal across, as we mentioned in Part 1, if you can send a signal, you can send a person, or a copy of their mind anyway. Now as we discussed there, the idea of conformal sacred cosmology is that in an ancient and burned out universe nothing is left over that can decay over time, which means anything which experiences time is gone, and everything we think of as matter which is able to experience time. Only massless objects experience no passage of time, 
and all massless objects must experience no time. Those are the photon, the particle of light, the graviton, the particle of gravity, and the gluon, the particle that glues quarks and nuclei together. There may be others, but we don't believe the neutrino is massless anymore and we can't actually be sure the others are, they could each be one part per trillion or gajillion mass energy to kinetic energy. It's hard to disprove something like that. Assuming they are totally massless, then in an era where all the matter has decayed, you just have these eternal particles left over, and photons can't undergo pale production in empty space so they should stay that way. Of course the concept of empty space and true vacuum is a bit dubious. Regardless, as we explained earlier, in the absence of any meaningful concept of time, a given photon is going to stretch over an infinitely long space, an infinite ribbon of that wavelength intersecting with tons of other such photons, and essentially you now have the mathematical equivalent of an infinitely dense point, same as when the Universe began. But that's where that conformal concept comes into play, with conformal rescaling, where the Universe is resetting but does so in a way that preserves the shape of its structure. All the angles of that grid of paper you're stretching and distorting, including the imprints of massive objects and events like black holes and gravitational waves. In this way, you can think of it as a dark energy eternal expansion version of the Big Crunch or Poincare recurrence, for the latter where the reset is not 100%. Personally I think it's a pretty neat theory and not the only one of its kind, we also have loop quantum cosmology, the bomb frampton model and cyclic brain cosmology approach Paul Steinhardt of Princeton University and Neil Turok of Cambridge University came up with back in 2001, which is the year I started grad school in physics and just a couple years after dark energy got confirmed, or the ekpyrotic model they and a couple others came up with at the same time to try to help explain some of the large scale structure of the cosmos that seemed at odds with its relatively short age. Time will tell if we can even come up with a way to usefully test these theories and I'd emphasize they all have their critics and weak points too, and we may explore them more in future episodes, but for now we'll wrap up our extended edition of Conformal Secret Cosmology and if you want to catch more of our Nebula exclusives when they first come out, you can sign up for those by going to go.nebula.tv slash Isaac Arthur to catch our current episode, Giant Space Monsters, or February's upcoming Topopolis, The Eternal River. As always, all the regular episodes of the show also come out on Nebula a few days early and ad-free. We have a lot of episodes coming up in February, for a total of 8 for February, and we had 8 back in January too that you can watch while you wait for those to come out, starting with Death Worlds this Thursday. If you'd like to get alerts when those episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. As always, thanks for watching and have a great week.